for today. We have a really special speaker coming in. Um, you might have seen him around on LinkedIn or taken some of his courses or workshops or seen some of his resources online. Um, for those who don't know, though, Chris is the founder of UX Playbook, um, where he helps frustrated designers figure out how to take control of their education, make better decisions, and ultimately build the career they want. So today, Chris will be giving a really awesome talk um, on why he left his traditional nine to five job behind and how he accidentally became a designpreneur, which is not something you wake up to every day. I'll hand over the stage to you, Chris. Sure. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. So let's click that share screen. And typically how I start the live events that I run, I always say, whenever you are, wherever you are, because it's either recorded or different time zones, but whenever you are, wherever you are, thank you for joining today. So let's initially start with the message tab. Who here has wanted to start a business but never got round to it? Let me know in the chat. Too many times. Thinking about it, great. Anybody else? Probably. Okay, too shy to type. That's fine. The other question I have for you is, who here has started working on an idea and somehow life got in the way and it fizzled and died? Who here has been in that situation? I know for myself, it's happened also too many times. Someone said me. Yes. Good. I need to move this chat closer so I can see all those lovely comments. Okay, great. If my clicker works, there you go. I mean, these things happen usually for a bunch of reasons. I mean, the easiest one to talk about is the money part, right? It, or it could be skills, maybe some healthy self-doubt or unjustified fears. Potentially, it's distractions of life, or you're just wondering how. Potentially, it's because it's a lonely journey. And can you actually handle it? Or is it too difficult. Starting a business or continuing to work on your own business is not easy. And I've definitely felt all the same sort of things as you when thinking and, and trying to start multiple businesses. So today, I want to share two things. The first thing is my accidental journey of how I became a designpreneur or a designer plus entrepreneur. And by telling you my story, I'll touch on the second thing, which is the eight lessons I learned along the way. So you don't have to. So if you're, in the, if you're on the same journey or at least want to start a business, you won't put it off by all the reasons that I mentioned before of why you can't start or why you shouldn't continue. Okay, sound fair? All right. And by reflecting in public, my hope is that this encourages some of you to create more things and break down some of the myths needed to build things for yourself as a designer or freelancer. Because in today's internet era, we glamorize entrepreneurship. They're celebrities, they're rock stars, they're idols. You know, they've graduated from Ivy League schools like Harvard. They previously worked at Apple. They get accepted in YC. They get funded by the best investors in the world. They sell their company for millions. And they make so much cash overnight, they could retire. Well, I just want to tell you guys here that those are just outliers. And most likely, that won't happen to you, and that won't be your journey, especially it didn't happen to me. Uh, and especially if it's your first time starting a business as a designer. So I'm here to tell you the real, real, the realities of a small business owner and the lessons along the way. Okay, know how to get funded, none of that stuff. But maybe you're asking, um, who's Chris? What has he done? And why is he speaking 
about entrepreneurship? Good questions. So over the last two years, I've been working on and off UX Playbook. UX Playbook is my UX education company to help designers go from fuzziness to focus with playbooks, courses, and coaching. It's where I'm building things I wish I had at the beginning of my self-taught designer journey. And in that time, we've generated $180,000 in revenue with an 80 profit, 80% 80 profit margin, built a community of over 68,000 designers across all social medias. Our free resources have been downloaded 12,000 times. But these aren't the typical numbers you see in the media of a successful business. It's not what you see in TechCrunch. It's not what you read in The Verge. It's not millions of dollars. But I'm still super happy with what we achieved. And remember, this is the reality of starting any small business. The numbers are more realistic than pe people typically share on social media. Okay? So just want to kind of lay that out there. But where did it all begin? So let's start at the beginning. In 2020, I decided to leave my job as the head of design at Thailand's first fintech unicorn. And then lockdown came. No backup, no direction on what to do next, no clue on what's going to happen in the world. But after being indoors for an extraordinary amount of time, I had an idea. The systems, processes, guides I had built in my previous team, I mean, at least I found them useful, and maybe other design managers would too. I think it would save them so much time with training and onboarding, so I decided to test this with five designer friends and ex-colleagues. I uploaded the product on Buy Me A Coffee, if anybody knows this, uh, to see what my test participants would do going through the checkout process. Not thinking of anything, right? Just, hey, go through the checkout process. If you click the buy button, just watch them kind of use the product. Then a week later, someone bought it. Then the next month, someone else bought it. And the month after that, more sales. Nine sales in three months. And I was like, whoa, okay. Uh, this was not meant to happen, okay? Uh, this was not ready. And this brings me to my first lesson. Lesson number one, get it out of your head and make it real. If I had spent time on the rounds and rounds of user testing to get feedback, to get the perfect product out, I might have never launched the product or launched it too late. Instead, I got lucky and my first customer bought it, right? By accident. It was never meant to be ready, as I said. We tend to overcomplicate how we go to market, the design, the details, all these things that in the grand scheme, I think, can be simplified. And oftentimes, it's as simple as having a hypothesis, building something quick, launch, and then test, right? No long, drawn-out research, no loss of momentum, no second-guessing ourselves. And remember, I said that I was building this for design managers. The first playbook was more targeted towards these managers, helping them train their team with guides like how to conduct stakeholder interviews. As this was solving my own problems, right? Training juniors as a head of design, I needed to sort of uh, onboard them with a guide. But the customers who actually bought the product were juniors wanting to learn UX. Would I have ever known that if the product wasn't out? Probably not. So this helped me with my positioning. I got the aha moment, like, oh, so people want to learn about UX through my guides, not managers wanting to use it for their team, right? So I wouldn't have ever learned that lesson. So lesson one, make it real. And making a few sales gave me the confidence to lean in. Over the next few weeks, I wrote a bunch of guides, created more and more design templates, bought a domain, called it UX Playbook, didn't call it anything first, right? It was just there. Uh, built a 
website in Squarespace. And even though I'm a designer, I could have designed it in Webflow, Framer, Figma, and then like, you know, got someone to code it. I decided to launch the website in a matter of days and not weeks. In my mind, this made the product more legitimate as it was out and gave me a chance to think about the brand as I was working on it. Okay. Then something unexpected happened. I had been interviewing for another head of design role elsewhere, just as you do when you're unemployed. Uh, and remember, I, I quit my previous role, so I had a lot of time on my hands and received an email that I got the job, right? A job offer for $150,000 after tax. And considering this role was based in Southeast Asia, that's amazing. For the folks that don't live in Southeast Asia, like what the hell, That like amazing, right? It was the most money I have ever been offered. It was with a blue chip venture back company growing extremely fast in a, in a field that's growing really, really fast, leading a small team of designers. And I was coming in as a player coach. So it'd be doing design and managing. So I was faced with basically two options. Option one, the rainbow, take the job. Option two, the, uh, the dark path, continue working as a co-founder of a Web3 startup at that time and work on UX playbook on the side. Number, so number one is job security and paycheck, the rainbow. And number two is the thrill of not knowing and potentially adventure. Probably one of the hardest decisions I had to make in my career. But ultimately, I went with option two. So I declined the best job offer I ever got and decided to bet on the then web free startup. We raised a bit of seed money, so that also gave me a bit of confidence and UX playbook as a side project. This takes us to lesson two. Define your risk cushion, okay? These were the questions I was asking myself and potentially some of the questions you can ask yourself when you're thinking about, should I or shouldn't I, okay? Can I afford to take risks? Do I think I can get another head of design role? Do I have at least six to 12 months of savings? Can I map out all my expenses and will they grow over time? What are the potential upsides and downsides? And this is one of my favorite questions that I ask myself, which is, if not now, when? And that was a huge question. I was like, oh, it's so true, right? Sometimes you just have to take these opportunities. But this might seem obvious to a lot of people, you know, asking these sort of questions. But for me, as someone who is not really a risky person when it comes to career and finances, it was a huge step at that time. I was lucky enough that I had some savings around about a two years run rate, the benefits of also living in Southeast Asia. And I had been consulting now and again, which was enough for me to sort of not burn a lot of my savings. And I was willing to bet on the potential upsides of the um, upsides against the offered salary. Again, 150,000 you know, take home was a lot for me at that time and still is. So fairly crazy that I made that decision. But before you go all in, you have to define your risks. Have clarity around the decision to help you decide path A and path B. Again, my favorite question on that list is, if not now, when? And as all this was happening, as I was making that, sort of decision, UX playbook grew on its own. Someone posted a TikTok about UX playbook and it went semi-viral. Um, it highlighted the templates and guides. This video is really short, like 11 seconds, but the video got 210,000 views, 24,000 likes, 8,000 saves from a designer at the time working for TikTok. And I couldn't believe it. And this is actually how those numbers or this video specifically affected revenue. 
these spikes in revenue, the ones I'm pointing to in the slides, are other people making content about UX playbook, right? So the graph here shows what I call year zero, June 2021 to April 2022. Why do I call it year zero? Because I literally put zero marketing effort. I just had this website up, right? And we generated over $4,000. I was like, oh, wait, wait. like, what's going on here? This got me thinking, maybe people like this thing. And probably I should tell more people about it. But even so, I was reluctant to be, quote unquote, what you call a content creator. Um, so back in 2020, I had made videos as a hobby uh, because I just wanted to learn about video creation and, and just make these fun stories. And the first video you see is uh, the one at the bottom called I Quit, right? That was my first foray into video creation. But content creation, like, is, like, is it a thing? Was it the right thing to do? How else do I tell people about my product? And a special shout out to Mia here, my girlfriend, who encouraged me and she just said, can you just do it and we'll see what happens? So I had just turned down the best job offer I've ever had. And then we saw the spike with the content uh, that it positively driving revenue. And I was like, okay, well, what else do I have to lose? So I did it. I started putting out content daily on Twitter and LinkedIn. It didn't require any fancy equipment. It was just me, a laptop, and God, lots amounts of coffee, right? It was the lowest barrier to entry, just starting to write. Then month one, 400 bucks, nothing to write home about. Month two, 2,000 bucks. I was like, whoa. Month three, 4,000 bucks. Month four, 6,000 bucks. Me and Mia couldn't believe it. It was clear something was working. And this brings me to lesson three, four, and five. Lesson three, commit to the process or don't do it. I committed to writing every single day. I committed to pressing that publish button. So I didn't have a follower goal. I wouldn't get upset if a post performed badly. And frankly, I didn't have huge ambitions as this was just another side project because I remember I was working on that Web3 startup. And instead of chasing followers, this was more of an exercise in discipline and more importantly, in skill building. Over time, I developed a muscle for writing and I started to see ideas for content everywhere. Right, It's really getting past the I suck phase, and that's usually where most people get stuck. And committing to what you control over external factors is so important. So this could be sales, it could be writing, it could be video, it could be photography, whatever it is, right? And building out your skills is so, so important not just for your entrepreneurial journey, but in a career as well. Which also brings me on to lesson four. True validation is when people vote with their dollars. This is, of course, my opinion. The other reasons why the follower count didn't really matter to me or any other vanity metric is because I knew what was important, right? Here's how I thought about it. Does my content reflect something useful? If so, useful enough for people to look at my product? If so, eventually, will they become a customer? For me, when I talk to content creators, uh, why build an audience when you don't have an offer, right? For me, it's just clear. People vote with their dollars, and to prove the thing that you built is useful, you should charge for it, right? Majority of us aren't building like life and death solutions, so start charging for the thing to get real validation. Not hypothetical uh, simulations or pricing surveys asking, how much would you pay for this? Like th those things don't really work. What you're doing as a small business owner is you're experimenting constantly. Your marketing, in this case, creating content, 
you're trying to find out, does this message resonate? Does this message build trust? Does this message increase conversions? In other words, your top, middle, bottom of the funnel content. And YC famously said, build something that people want. So how do you know what people want? Not by you, not by them telling you, but by them actually paying for it. I want to repeat that again. Real validation is where people vote with their dollars. Okay? Over vanity metrics. Moving on to lesson five. One of my favorites. One person believing in you is enough. When I was unsure that this was the right thing to do, when I doubted myself, when I asked myself, why would anyone read what I have to write? I had someone push me outside my comfort zone. And, and I'm pretty sure that if I told 90% of my friends and family about doing what I was doing, you know, not doing the job thing, they would think I'm incredibly foolish. But one person didn't think I was foolish. And that, for me, was all that mattered. Because they gave you permission to trust your gut. Sometimes we tend to think with our head way too much, right? The best manager I've ever had required me to do things that I thought I couldn't do. She set the bar for me to live up to. And, you know, entrepreneurship is hard. It's lonely. So you need to find that person around you that believes in you and stick with them. We've all had people that tell us, this won't work. This is dumb. I don't get it. And this is the exact opposite of a person you need when you're going to start something, right? You really need some optimism, especially at the beginning. Things were going well for UX Playbook. But at the same time, I was doing a bunch of other things. So I was a co-founder at a Web3 startup, the one I'm showing now. We won a runner-up prize in a Solana coding cap. It was pretty cool at the time. But I also launched a bunch of different SaaS projects. Um, also co-founded a YouTube agency with these fine folks in the picture. I even joined a startup incubator. So I was just juggling a lot of things. You know, I was unemployed. I was like exploring as an entrepreneur or at least a wannabe entrepreneur. Uh, then July 2023, not too long ago, I stopped every project. In truth, they actually all failed. Failed to raise money, failed to generate revenue, failed to find product market fit. Except for one. Can you guess what it is? It was UX Playbook. The fact that it was ger generating revenue was great. This was the, probably the only thing that was generating revenue at the time. But since our, you know, I showed the graph before of our four month spike, there was actually no growth. And worse, it was on the decline. If you see those down arrows, it was trending downwards. I and Mia, my partner, decided we were going to focus to work solely on UX Playbook. But that was July. But in October, we actually hit our low point. So we had spent four months working just 110% on UX Playbook, and we still didn't manage to break the $5,000 a month mark. And this was two of us working full time, right? Not a great salary by any means. Um, also, we wondered if, if it would ever break that, you know, $6,000 mark that we, we got to at our peak. Um, the folks that we started with on this journey, especially um, being on the internet or the indie hacker community, we saw folks generate hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like, Revenue milestone shared like 20k a month, 30k a month, 40k a month. And I and Mia were just like, maybe we should quit. Right? She said this in October. And, and this was the same person that was encouraging me at the beginning, right? Encouraging me to try, full of optimism, like, you can do it, let's just try. But after four months of media 
med- mediocre performance, she said what we were both thinking. Maybe we should just quit. I mean, I could maybe potentially find another head of design role or, or a lead designer role. Maybe I could reach back out to the company that offered me a role to see if something was available. Maybe contact my previous consultant gig to see if they had anything. You know, just a lot of maybes. But after that initial conversation of maybe we should quit, we didn't speak about it again for the next two days. Didn't touch around the sub- subject at all, right? We both needed time to process. And when we did have that conversation, I asked her two questions. If money wasn't the immediate goal, would you still be working on this thing? Do you have conviction that this would eventually work? She said yes, and I agreed. So we kept going. And this brings me to lesson six. Reflect and reframe. The questions we needed to ask ourselves when we faced hard times was, do we have conviction? I mean, your question might be different depending on what you're going through in your situation. But after I said, yes, I have conviction that this would work. I reframed my thinking and said, anything above break even is actually a win. Because how I thought about it was, hey, I'm working on this thing, which is my own, and I could decide on what I want to work on, right? I get ultimate freedom. I get that flexible schedule. I'm basically playing and creating on the internet. Results aside, that's pretty damn cool, right? Uh, Let me know if you agree, (laughs) or am I just making this up? Uh, But when you face tough times during your journey, I would stop, reflect, and reframe. Ask why are you doing this? Ask what purpose does it serve? Ask what else would you rather be doing, right? Those are just some questions to get you started. But fundamentally, you need to figure out what types of questions could help me reframe the situation I'm in, especially when it's a tough time. And it has to be a bunch of questions, a lot of questions, right? So just trigger that sort of aha moment for yourself. And in November, the very next month after having that discussion of should we quit, we hit $10,000 in revenue. Some reason that lifted a weight off my shoulders. I felt like I didn't have the doubts and the uncertainty I once had. Like, I'm not sure why that number is so important for me. I mean, it could be the indie hacking community subconsciously implanting that number in my mind. Maybe it was a signal that this thing wasn't dying. Maybe it was just validation. And this leads me to lesson seven. The story you tell yourself matters. At least it did for me. And the good thing is you can change that story. So the funny thing is, um, this was in November, right? We hit our goal. We're like, oh, 10K, that's crazy. Uh, But the funny thing is in December, the very next month, we just made our average revenue, right? Normally, I would be stressing out about this, but that didn't matter. In my head, I had got to a place where this number meant something. And for you, it would mean something different, okay? Even though it sounds silly for me, right, just saying this right now, but I felt like somehow in, inside of me, I, I felt like I wasn't a junior anymore and maybe I deserved the job title of like mid-level entrepreneur. I, I don't know what it was. It, it sounds silly, but I'm sure like you guys out there get frustrated when you're not being promoted when you know you're good enough for the next level, right? So like from junior to mid or mid to senior, you're just like, I know I can do it, but I need that validation, right? And when 
I got that feeling where like, holy shit, maybe I've graduated or maybe I've stepped up my game. In my head, I said, fuck, that feels so good, right? The highs in entrepreneurship are extremely high, but the lows are also extremely low. In fact, they are painful. They're your next existential crisis, right? Trust me, I've had one not too long ago. So you just need to make sure the story you tell yourself is one that you can get behind, okay? So lesson seven, the story you tell yourself matters. So I want to share um, some milestones of UX playbook since then, okay? So it took us 18 months to hit $10,000 in one month, right? And it was a very, very long 18 months, as you can tell. Um, it took us 23 months to make $100,000 in lifetime revenue. So that's the lifetime of the business, how much money we've made. And the last month, month 28, we actually hit our all-time high of $22,000 in one month, right? Finally surpassing the salary of that job offer I got before I created content, right? The head of design role I said no to. Even more validation that we were making, building, and putting things out there that people valued and actually made an impact. So that was a great feeling. So here's the final lesson. Lesson eight, the game of entrepreneurship is a game of slow burns. It's a game of tweaking. It's a game of iterating. It's a game of patience. There rarely is a single moment. You have to let it, you have to let the compounding magic work, right? That's the reality for most business owners, especially small business owners. There's no silver bullet. There's no hockey stick growth. There's no millionaires overnight. But I often think if I said to Mia in October, let's just quit. You're right. I think this ain't working. I'll never know what it could have been. I would have said, yeah, this shit doesn't work. You know, I can't do this shit. Let's just go get a job. With entrepreneurs being so glamorized and social media with its instant gratification, most of us give up before we ever truly get started, right? The truth is without endless capital and the knowledge of starting your own business, you need to stick around and reap the rewards of compounding. I think as long as you're in the game, slowly tweaking, it will pay off on a long enough time horizon. It's whether or not you have the cojones to stick with it. So here is the eight lessons. Make it real. Just get it out of your head and into the hands of the people you're building the product for. Define your risk cushion. Know what you're betting on. Know what are the upsides and what are the downsides. Commit to the process. Commit to building skills versus things outside of your control. Validation is people paying you for stuff. So stop testing in hypothetical environments and get that stuff out in the market. One person believing you is enough because the journey is tough and you need optimism on your side. Reflect and reframe when times are tough and ask yourself questions to unblock your own thinking. The story behind why you're doing this can make external noise and pressures disappear. Continue to build your own narrative and find what matters to you. And lastly, it's a game of slow burns. And compounding takes time, rarely an aha moment. Stay in the game to reap the rewards. Don't quit too soon. And that's all I have for you today. But before going, I hope that you see yourself in my story, whether you started a business or not, and whether you're on the journey or not. I hope this gives you some inspiration to create things, make mistakes, and keep pushing. And with that, I just want to say thank you.